Thank you, Laymans. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this and try and reshare it. So just give me a second here. Do you want me to do the reading from Hebrews? Uh, yes. Uh, just one quick second here, Doug. Okay, can everybody see the screen, the Hebrew screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Doug. Thank you. Uh, this is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous, a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father, because he considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so, from this one man, and he, as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they, di when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Thanks, Doug. Sorry about the mess up with the slides, but um, I think I've got, everybody can see it now, okay? Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. So uh, let me move my here. This passage here, um, the beginning of what, uh, now of course the author goes on and speaks about faith in all these uh, lives of these Old Testament figures. And, uh, and the author starts off with this line, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. And that's what I'm gonna be uh, focusing on in this sermon. Before I get into that, I wanted to make note of something that possibly a couple of you have noticed. Um, uh, we've been in the book of Hebrews for some time now, and or for a couple months, maybe three months or so. And you may have noticed that just uh, recently, uh, I skipped some large passages in Hebrews eight through 10. Uh, I skipped major portions of the letter. I did want to talk about that a little bit just because um, 
it does relate uh, just to us as a church as a whole and um, and, and uh, how I preach through things. Um, so there's two reasons why I skipped uh, large portions of Hebrews. Um, one uh, is that a lot of it has to do with uh, this part of the, the book of Hebrews, a lot of it has to do with talking to Jewish people at that time about what makes uh, Jesus uh, the one true high priest, as opposed to the, the priests of old uh, who lived back then, the, the priests of the temple who made daily sacrifices on behalf of the people and whatnot. And so they're making this argument in a sense that we no longer need those regular uh, sacrifices uh, for the temple and so on and so forth. And that is not exactly a burning question in a lot of lives of modern North Americans. I've never really had anybody come to my office and say, I wonder why we don't sacrifice in the temple anymore. I mean, there are interesting questions about, uh, revolving around that and interesting historical discussions, but it's not exactly a burning issue uh, for uh, the, the, the modern uh, believer. So that's some of this material I skipped just because it was uh, making a case for something that really is, is no longer um, prevalent in, in our society. Uh, but the, the, uh, the main one I wanted to address was I skipped um, one of the hardest passages in, in the, the book of Hebrews uh, regarding uh, the falling away from faith, uh, the falling away from things that we believe, uh, the loss of our salvation. Um, in, in Hebrews 10, there's a very difficult passage about uh, these things, and it relates to Hebrews 3 and 4 as well. And I skipped that, not because it is so difficult and because it is... Um, yeah, just a tough thing to, to preach through, uh, but because I preached through it on February 9th when I was preaching on Hebrews 3 and 4, uh, I referenced this passage a couple times and um, dealt with that topic in full. And so if you're curious to know what my thoughts are on that passage or what uh, the author is trying to say in depth, February 9th, uh, I have the YouTube video of the sermon is up there and it's called The Other Wages of Sin. And I just, I, it would have been me repeating myself uh, from February, so I skipped that. <laughs> so in summary, um, that might be a, somewhat a long explanation, but I did want to say that I do sometimes uh, skip parts of books uh, for three possible reasons. One, it's either on a topic that just isn't relevant. Uh, I'm not going to preach on how to build the tabernacle from Exodus 26 because nobody needs to know how to build the tabernacle anymore. Um, two, I might feel strongly that God has called me to preach somewhere else, uh, go to a different book or something I might feel called to preach somewhere else. Um, or three, I've recently covered that material already in a different sermon in a different way. Um, so I don't, I just want to say very clearly, I don't skip passages when preaching through a Bible because I, it's difficult or contentious or because I'm worried about blowback or anything like that. Uh, so that's why we're uh, jumping ahead here to Hebrews 11. Um, interestingly enough, just as long as I have you on the line as captive audiences, <laughs> one of the most uh, one of the most difficult things about preaching regularly every Sunday, especially I think in a small church, maybe it's true of larger churches as well, I don't know, but one of the most complicated things is uh, oftentimes when you're preaching through a, a book or a letter or a passage, um, you'll find yourself thinking while you're writing the sermon, so-and-so is going to think that I compose this sermon specifically for them because of a conversation we had this week or last week or because of some uh, debate that's going on or some, you know, and, and you almost, uh, I, you almost want to change the sermon because you're so concerned that someone's going to think you're, you know, that you're speaking directly to them. And I assure you, I don't do that. When I work on my sermons, I don't uh, think, oh, you know, Dinah and I had this conversation last week about this topic, and I'm going to write the sermon for Dinah, and so she can, I really, I try to let the Holy Spirit keep his hand on the tiller and listen to what God would have me say and not think about particulars in the church. So all that to say, if you feel like God is really speaking uh, through a sermon to you personally, that it, it's handmade, hand tailor made for you, it really is. I didn't uh, construe that or, or artificially uh, create that moment. Um, so that's, that's just a bit of background as to why we're uh, jumping into Hebrews 11 here and uh, skipping a couple of these things. So, um, and a bit about my philosophy of preaching as well. So anyway, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So I want to look real carefully at this sentence. It's at the core of the gospel. I'm going to start with the first part. 
faith is confidence in what we hope for. Now the gospel, uh, the good news of the cross and the resurrection is not a tragedy. A tragedy is hope in something that you will never receive. A tragedy is hope in something that you will never receive. And we have a million books and a million movies all based on the angst derived from a false hope, right? Unrealized dreams, unrequited love, unfinished masterpieces, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, this is the, the definition of tragedy. And if you have no confidence in what you hope for, then your hope is not a comfort to you. And not only that, but your hope becomes like a devil on your back. Um, so for example, I could hope that this virus and the shelter at home rules and all that goes with it will be gone tomorrow. I could hope that when I wake up in the morning, it would all be as a bad dream, but I know that my hope will be dashed in the morning. And so it's, it's no hope at all. It's rather a kind of torture. And so I let go of hope in that sense, and I trust in the Lord. Now, we call the story of Jesus Christ, his life and his death and his resurrection, the gospel, which, uh, as some of you may know, is an old English translation of the Greek word euangelion, uh, which means good news. But it's not good news if you have no confidence in it. And that confidence comes from confidence in God's faithfulness to us. And I'll say it again, that confidence that we have in the gospel, the good news, what makes it good is the confidence that comes from God's faithfulness to us. And what I've seen in this world, spiritually, is that one of the things that Satan loves to do, and does it all the time, is to take the gospel, the good news, and edit it, or tweak it, or alter it, so that it looks similar to the good news, but it's just different enough to make it the worst news of all. Because the confidence switches from a confidence in God and his faithfulness to a confidence in you, or in me, or in some other human. And this is a very common heresy that trips people up and puts people into a very dark space. Um, and in the realm of what Christian heresies, um, you would find um, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, both to be adequate examples of the focus going from God's faithfulness to yours. I'm not going to take the time to unpack that, uh, but uh, that's part of the theology switch that's made there. And the most successful Abrahamic monotheistic faith, in other words, a monotheistic faith that traces their line back to Abraham, that emphasizes our faithfulness over God's would be the Muslim faith. Now, please know, and I really can't stress this enough, I have friends, close friends, from these various backgrounds, people I love, people I would die for. Um, I harbor no disgust or prejudice for people who adhere uh, to these views. I do feel a very deep pity uh, for that spiritual frame of mind and the subsequent struggles and fears uh, that they have in this world. We should not take for granted the gospel, the confidence in what you hope for. And as the author of Hebrews goes to great lengths to point out, the reason you have that confidence is because your salvation does not rest on you. And I'm going to quote here briefly uh, from Hebrews chapter 7. I don't have it on the PowerPoint. Um, but this is a description of Jesus. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his sins, then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints high priests at men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. Now, rhetorical question, uh, well, it has to be rhetorical, you're all muted. <laughs> uh, does any of that sound 
as though it has anything to do with you and your strength? And the answer, of course, is no. No, it doesn't. Is the author saying that you are saved because you are holy and blameless and pure and set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens and so forth? No, of course not. It's Christ. You would have no confidence in that. The good news, the gospel, entails God's lack of confidence in you and a lack of confidence in your ability to become holy by your own efforts. And that is not something we should take for granted. And that is what makes the gospel the gospel. Uh, consider the Quran. Um, it teaches that salvation is based on purification by good deeds. Now, we all love good deeds. We, we have agreement with our Muslim brothers and sisters that good deeds are by definition good. But the Quran teaches a Muslim can become righteous through prayer, almsgiving, fasting, living according to the Quran, and so on and so forth. Now, how much prayer, how much almsgiving, what sort of righteousness? Well, these things, by definition, almost are not quite as clear. And so what you have is this dividing line between heaven and the hell, between heaven and hell, in a lot of these traditions is very clear. It's the line between the righteous and the unrighteous. But where are you on any given day in terms of that line? Well, that's anybody's guess. Now imagine, I mean, really think about this. That Imagine that was your view of God and your view of the gospel. So you have hope. You have hope in heaven, hope to become a righteous person, but no confidence. And think about what you would do to gain that confidence, the confidence of heaven, the confidence to be able to become a righteous person. What hoops would you jump through? What links would you go to? I did, uh, my bachelor's program was here at the U of I in religious studies. And I got to rub shoulders with uh, people from a number of different religious traditions in that program, uh, many of whom were Muslims. And people often point to Muslim fidelity and piety and say, look how faithful uh, many Muslims are. And they're absolutely right. That is absolutely true. Praying five times a day, going at least once in their lifetime to Mecca, a spiritual journey called the Hajj, to circle the Kaaba seven times. All Muslims do that if they can. Uh, the strict adherence to principles of clothing, food, sexuality, so on down the line. Every aspect of their life uh, adhering uh, to these uh, rules of piety and faith. And it is piety. It is faith. But it is a faith that is undergirded and goaded on by a deep anxiety and fear and lack of confidence because of course they're human, just like us. Just like you know, deep in your heart, that you do not have the power or the strength of will on your own to just become a righteous person. You can't wake up tomorrow morning and say, I, Seth Curlin, tomorrow's the day I'm going to become a righteous person and live my life in complete adherence to the righteousness of God and become holy. I know I can't do that. And deep down inside, everybody knows their, their failings and that they cannot do that. And so all that's left is a hope of following the rules and doing everything you're told by the Quran or the Hadith in the case of Islam, in Christianity, whatever rules that we deem to be the ones that draws closest to God. And we hope and pray that on that day, on the day that we are judged, that we'll be good good enough to be called righteous. This is a very deep anxiety. This is a very deep and profound fear uh, to, to have as a human being, and it's in all of us. Uh, this is one of the reasons actually in Islam that the Hajj is considered a, a rebirth. And uh, I'll read this from uh, the Hadith, uh, one of uh, Muhammad's sayings. Uh, the ones who perform Hajj who go to Mecca in its proper and complete form as all their past sins forgiven from Allah, and they return to their homes as a newborn comes into the world, sinless. The Prophet Muhammad said, 
whoever performs Hajj to the Kaaba and does not commit any obscenity and wrongdoing, he or she will come out as the day they were born, pure and free from sins. In contrast, here is the gospel. There is no special prayer, no special trip, no series of pious undertakings, no amount of money you can give to the poor, no special liturgical formula, no special way of doing anything, confession or communion, no series of actions that you can take that will turn you into a righteous person. You cannot be free from sin by those actions, by any actions. So you can let all such thoughts go, and you can consign all that hope to the trash can. It's pointless, it's meaningless, you'll waste your energy and destroy your joy in a task you have no hope of completing. And that is the good news. One of the first experiences I had as I gradually gave my life to Christ, which was a gradual experience for me, was the lifting of my shoulders, the unbending of my back, if you will. There was such a freedom and such a delight in being able to say without fear, I am a sinner. I am a man who is well acquainted with and skilled at lying, at pride, at lusting, greed, narcissism, jealousy, and so on down the line. I can say it to myself. I can say it to my God, my creator, without fear. Here I am, Lord. Have mercy on me, a sinner. There is such freedom in that, that every day I still delight in that. Every day, I still experience the gospel to say, Lord, here am I, a sinner. Do with me what you will. Have your way in me. To be able to claim our shame and also our glory, which is also real, with no fear of becoming anathema to the presence of God. Honesty becomes the order of the day, and salvation rests on God's shoulders and not on mine. That is the essence of the gospel. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, which is the salvation of God. Now, assurance about what we do not see, the second part of the scripture there. Assurance about what we do not see. As a follower of Jesus who lives in freedom, I am always trying to invite people into that same freedom, not about numbers or growing a church or these kind of crass things, but about compassion and about love and the delight of following Christ. This is about seeing the world through the eyes of your Lord and weeping for it and loving it. But I never invite anyone into, and I hope you would do the same, that you would never invite anyone into blind faith. I never invite anyone into blind faith. There's no such thing. I do not believe in it. It's not a biblical phrase or concept. <coughs> Excuse me. If you embrace a blind faith, then you are grasping in the dark, sightless. But to come to the Lord is to come into the light and to see things as they truly are. And I'll quote here from uh, 1 John chapter 1. This is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We have assurance about things we do not see and have not seen, not because we are blind, but because the most important truths of this world are invisible to our eyes. The most important truths of this world are invisible to our eyes, and we know that. It doesn't take much reflection. Uh, think of uh, the confidence that my children have, or my spouse has, and my love for them. Well, now, that's not written on my forehead. You know, my, it's not physically evident upon my being, 
all my children have is the preponderance of evidence. In other words, how I speak to them, how I care for them, how I provide for them. So that's how they know I love them. It's no accident that the Hebrew word for the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is ruach, which is the exact same word for wind. They experienced God's Spirit in precisely the same way that they experienced the wind, which is to say, you can't see the wind, it's not visible, but you see its impact everywhere and you can feel it. Same with the Spirit of the Lord, ruach. Now, we take this for granted today to some degree. We miss how profound this is because we live in a world of invisible things, don't we? That we take for granted, uh, us moderns. We know intellectually that the world is made up of things we cannot see. Uh, atoms, molecules, and yes, especially today, our mind is focused on viruses. Uh, impacts everything, especially today, even though our, the naked eye cannot perceive it. So our study of the world continues to reveal to us how much of the world is invisible to us. And this was assuredly not the case in the ancient world when the Bible was written, with no concept of the range of things that exist that we cannot see, uh, the ancients put a lot of stock in seeing things, spiritually and otherwise. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, the pagan statues of their gods, uh, what we would call idols, were so vital, as they were said often to contain the spirit or the essence of their gods. And uh, most famously, that's why, of course, the Egyptians built, uh, to this day, jaw-dropping statues, pyramids, uh, to give physical weight and form uh, to their gods that they were worshiping and to push back against death that they feared so much. In other words, they wanted assurance from the things that they could see, the physical things they could build. And this is one of the reasons why the Hebrews, the ancient Jews, were so ridiculed. And they were ridiculed uh, when others discovered uh, that their God had no image and that in the inner sanctum of the temple, uh, the, the, the Holy of Holies, when you, if you draw back the curtain, there's nothing there. There is no image of God. It was just the presence of the Lord. Assurance about what we do not see because God is too big and too, too profound to be seen visibly in any fashion. And this continues, Jesus makes this explicit. Um, you remember when Thomas finally sees in, in the flesh the risen Christ, and Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Where is the risen Christ now? We cannot see him, but the Holy Spirit, Ruach, shows him to us every day in so many different ways. I have some listed here. When you do an unexpected kindness for a stranger, when you pray in private for an enemy, when you turn away from pride to humility, then you're taking the invisible God, making him visible in your life and hopefully in other lives. These are our pyramids. These are our statues, our proclamation that God is everywhere and invisible though he may be. We have confidence in his love and forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. We'll never expect blind faith from anyone. I think it's a kind of foolishness. We have the evidence of scripture. And just as important in the cynical age, the evidence of the reliability of scripture, the evidence of the renewing of our own hearts in Christ, the evidence of the miracles God continues to do in our lives, the evidence of God's creativity and love and the beauty of creation all around us and so on and so forth. Faith is not blind. Peter says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord from 1 Peter chapter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. 
we have assurance of things that are not visible to the naked eye. It's the opposite of blind faith. It's a faith that sees and exposes the hidden things to the light. We have evidence of them and can speak of that evidence, and the Holy Spirit confirms in our souls the truth of them. So if you have confidence in what you hope for and assurance about what you cannot see, can God use you? Well, I would say, yes, God can use you. I want to make one last note. Um, so th th this sentence kicks off this very long uh, passage here in um, Hebrews chapter 11, where the author is talking about all these various Old Testament characters and how by faith they did this, and by faith God did that, and by faith this, and by faith that. And if you go, if you read that chapter and you go to the very last person, uh, that the author mentions uh, by name uh, before going on to the next point, you'll notice that it's Rahab. Rahab, the prostitute. And not just Rahab, the prostitute, Rahab, the pagan prostitute, if you remember her story. It's hard to imagine a person whom you would think would be more outside of the kingdom of God, more outside of what we would call a holy and righteous person, than a pagan prostitute uh, living in a Canaanite city at that time. But she had, she had faith, she had confidence and hope, and she had assurance in the character of God, though she could not see him. And it saved her. And what's more, God used her uh, to accomplish his purposes. And so all the, this list of characters, wherever you are in that, Wherever you are in that list, um, God can use you, and God can bring you into a place of light and joy, and not of blind faith, but a place of faith of confidence and of assurance. And so I hope in this, these coming weeks and months, especially as we grow weary of uh, coronavirus issues, that you'll have confidence and assurance in your faith and that the gospel will be stronger, more real, more true in your life. May it be so, in Jesus' name. So I'm going to get, uh, give me a second here. John Rene is going to share, is John Rene with us? Oh, is John Rene not with us? No, he's with us. Oh, yes. Okay, I don't see him on the... I am with... I am oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. Hey, John. <laughs> yeah. um, he's going to share a song with us. Oh, we can sing also together. It doesn't matter. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, he and for me, he live and die, to buy my pardon, and empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds my future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy. 
such well as to calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all faith is gone because i know holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I cross the river I find the fire what we've been and then as they his way to victory I'll see the light of glory and I know he reigns because he lives because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds our future. And life is worth the living chance. Yes, because Jesus lives. Amen. Thank you, Jean Rene. Uh, that's our service. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and uh, go uh, chat, among, chat amongst yourselves. <laughs> You're not going to play your song, Sathers? Ah, uh, well, uh, no, it seemed I. Play your song, Seth. Uh, no, play your song. Okay. It's not. <laughs> Come on, Seth. Come on, Seth. Come on, Seth. Thank you. Play your song. All right. All right. All right. Play, it's not my play. song. I didn't play. write it. By popular demand. By popular, that's right. <laughs> uh, this is a, a song we do it. Uh, been doing occasionally at church before we went to shelter at home. Um, Psalm 130, the words are written by uh, Martin Luther. Man, we got to get that up there. Set to, uh, set to uh, music back in 1997 by Red Mountain Church. Hold on a minute here. Let me, uh, Okay. Can you hear the guitar? Yeah, okay. Oh, 
Hey, thanks, Seth. It is good to see you all. Oh, hey, Johnsons. I didn't know you were here. Mm -hmm. There's the brackets. Does anybody have any prayer requests at all? 